Hi, I'm Neve. I run the Instagram account Books of Brain Food, and today I want to share with you the five books that I read in January. It's been quite a strong reading month for me. I've picked out some books that I think I'll be recommending to a lot of people. So the first book I read was My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Otessa Moschweg. I saw it all over Instagram um, and I thought that a book about rest and relaxation might be kind of nice after 2020. It's the year 2000 in the world's greatest city, a glitter with wealth and possibility. What could be so terribly wrong? Basically the narrator um, has just lost her parents. Her life is feeling a bit meaningless and she attempts to sleep for a year getting these um, illegal prescription drugs um, from this really dodgy therapist. I think the thing Otessa Moschweg does really well is that she's able to create this like insufferable horrible character that you're not rooting for at all without making her like problematic or like triggering to anybody. Like she's just genuinely such a self-centered horrible person. You have to sort of read between the lines to see what's really going on with her friendships. And her friendship with Reva um, it's very fraught. Uh, there's a lot of jealousy involved um, of material goods and of looks. They're obviously both going through so much and they're kind of weirdly dependent on each other. She also enables Reva's um, eating disorder. I think Otessa Moschweg also sort of deals with this idea that rest is privilege. The narrator is able to completely withdraw from society. She leaves her job she has her apartment fully paid for, she has no bills or anything to worry about. She just is able to leave everything for a year and just sleep and I think that just is like a massive privilege to be able to take that big chunk of time um, out from participating in society. There's also a lot in here about like rebirth which I think is quite interesting and I think she's about 26 so she's in that period where she's transitioning between being a young adult and like a proper adult so yeah I quite enjoyed this and I probably recommend it to you if you're into like modern fiction and if you like an unreliable dislikable narrator then this could be a good one for you to pick up so the next one I've got is Winter by Ali Smith um, I really like this one I was really surprised at its depth I really wasn't sure what it was about Whenever I picked it up, it was really nice to read in January. I also think it would be a nice December read um, around Christmas time, but I still think um, it kind of works in that like transitional after Christmas between New Year's period when four people, strangers and family, converge on a 15 bedroom house in Cornwall for Christmas. Will there be enough room for everyone? So this one's kind of like a modern retelling of A Christmas Carol, um, which I thought was quite cool. First line in A Christmas Carol, I think says Marley was dead. Um, and this one starts off quite similar, it says God was dead to begin with, and romance was dead, chivalry was dead, poetry, the novel, painting, they were all dead, and art was dead. There's quite a lot of parallels between the main character, um, Sophia, and Scrooge. Um, she's this kind of older woman who doesn't really understand the ideals of the youth. Um, she comes into conflict a lot in her daily life with things like technology, um, in things like the bank and the supermarket where she doesn't really fully understand and she feels kind of like ostracized by that. It also follows her son Art. Um, I think his name is quite symbolic, his name's Arthur but they call him Art um, and he's this kind of like annoying millennial man who like doesn't really see the impact that his actions have on the real world. He claims to be apolitical and I think it's kind of funny to have a character called Art um, who claims he's not political whenever that's like such a cultural conversation about like that all art is political. Art is supposed to bring home his girlfriend for Christmas um, but they actually split like just before they're meant to leave so he ends up hiring this girl called Lux who's a university student or university dropout um, to play his girlfriend Charlotte. Her character is associated quite a lot with Cymbeline by Shakespeare um, and I think having a Shakespearean element with anything like this is really interesting because everything to do with Shakespeare is like mistaken identity and like this comic idea of people not being who they're supposed to be um, which is such a strong theme in this but it also just has those like millennial anxieties about like bringing home a partner to meet your parents. Ali Smith's really good at engaging with the socio-political elements of the time that she's writing. And even the concept of this like there's a 15 bedroom house in Cornwall but Sophia doesn't think there's room for like four people in it um, has something to say about her xenophobia about things like the migrant crisis that is happening at this time. So this one's really clever. I think this is a really um, mentally stimulating read. It's a bit confusing and abstract at times um, but it always stays quite readable and um, the language is quite accessible. Um, I'm sure there's a lot in this that's gone over my head um, to do with politics um, but you could also just read it for the story and still really enjoy it um, so highly recommend this one. This one is my favourite book of the month surely for how much of an achievement I feel from getting through it which is kind of a stupid reason to read anything but I feel like that's ingrained in you from being a student. So of course it's 
Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy. Um, I really enjoyed this. I was expecting to find it more challenging um, language-wise, which I think was helped because I have a really good translation. So it's quite um, modern at times, which is quite nice. Um, it's very accessible. This is so, about so much more than just the story of Anna and Count Vronsky. If you don't know, Anna is this older married woman who kind of like falls prey to the affections of this young army officer um, called Vronsky. It kind of like ruins her whole life, which is basically the premise of this story. But it also follows um, the characters around them, um, like Constantine Levin, who I like love, I think he's a great character, um, and his sort of like existential anxieties. Um, he doesn't know why he's on the earth, he's kind of like lost his way of the religion. Um, but he ends up finding this other meaning to life um, through his wife Kitty, which I think is quite nice. I find Levin to be the more captivating character, just because I knew that he was the self-insert of Tolstoy himself. So um, there's a lot of details in this that are quite accurate to Tolstoy's life. Even down to whenever Tolstoy was getting married, it was late to the ceremony because there was a button missing from his shirt or it needed um, pressed or something. Um, and it's, the same thing happens with Levin in this book. He's kind of this like social outcast. He doesn't really know where he fits with all of these other people, even though he really loves them. Um, but he doesn't really know like what he's doing in life or what his purpose is. I really love the last chapter. Um, Levin's kind of like standing on a balcony and like looking at the stars and like thinking about um, what the meaning of life is and then he kind of says that like um, there is no meaning to life so you can give it meaning like it leaves this like blank slate and I also think after 800 pages of high society pettiness he's kind of just showing that th that is the meaning of life like the way that we interact with each other and the way we impact each other's lives which I wasn't expecting to be the moral reasoning from this book mm. but I felt that quite strongly throughout it. There's also this like pull between like Russia and the West and um, the train becomes more of a an important symbol in this text. Um, the train's always sort of like a symbol of social progress that sort of like signals transition and um, it's a very big symbol of industrialization. And I think it's quite interesting um, the way that Anna comes into contact with the train. It's starting to get dark so I hope the light's okay. Anna Karanana was like a really fun reading experience because it's such a big one to take off the bucket list but it was also just so enjoyable. I also really recommend watching the film it's by the same director as um, the 2005 Pride and Prejudice. Um, some of it's a bit like overacted and stupid, but they do this like really interesting metaphor with the stage. So like all the social action happens on the stage um, and it's like kind of experimental and quite good. Um, so if you don't want to read, sit and read the whole book, I really recommend watching the film to kind of like pick up on the key themes and symbols. Um, I think it's good for that. So the fourth book I read was Pine by Francine Toon. Um, I was really excited for this. I thought it was going to be like Lanny, which I talked about in my other video. In a community where daughters rebel and men quietly rage, mysteries like these are not out of the ordinary. Lauren looks for answers in her tarot cards, hoping she might be able to read her father's turbulent mind. Neighbours know more than they let on, but when a local teenager goes missing, it's no longer clear who she can trust. So I thought that sounded like a really interesting premise for a thriller. It's also advertised as a gothic thriller. Uh, thriller. Um, it's about a little girl called Lauren and her father Niall. Lauren's mother disappears whenever she's young and they don't really know what happens to her. They're trying to uncover this mystery about her while these strange events are going on, like things are happening in the house. Um, it's all very spooky and eerie. I talked a bit about this on my Instagram stories. The main issue I had with this one was the dialogue. The dialogue was really American and it's set in the Scottish Highlands and written by a Scottish author and it just felt like a bit tropey and cliched. So I was expecting Pine to deal with all of these issues of like small town repression and toxic masculinity and maybe a bit more Scottish folklore than there actually was in the text. I didn't feel like it did what it set out to do. I feel like it kind of missed the point. I just didn't think it really worked. I still read the whole thing in about two days um, so obviously the thriller element of it had some kind of like momentum but I would recommend this maybe for like if you're going on a holiday even to a cold place would be quite nice to have like this Scottish Highlands thriller. If you're looking for like something that actually examines Scottish society like this isn't it. <laughs> so the last thing I read this month was Natives by Akala. I actually listened to this on Audible. I really enjoyed listening to it. I know that Akala is a spoken word poet and that comes across really well. He's a really good speaker. So this is basically like um, discussing how the Empire and the British Empire sort of like impacts the daily lives of um, black people in the UK and, um, and of everybody, how it's still so present even though things like slavery and apartheid and um, the very big obvious evils are over. There's still so much stuff in our society and our institutions that's um, still not treating black people um, the way that they should be. I feel like whenever the Black Lives Matter protests happened, 
um, people in the UK would say things like um, no Britain isn't racist anymore and like that's obviously not true but this book does a really good job of bearing down the specifics of racism in the UK especially in like the late 80s and 90s whenever Akala was going to school he has a lot of personal an anecdotes about how he was treated by teachers by other students and um, xenophobic parents of other kids he also talks a lot about his experience with knife crime and police violence in the UK. There was a very interesting story in this about Samuel L. Jackson. I think he was saying that black people in the UK hadn't experienced racism the same way that black people in America had and that they shouldn't be allowed to take these black film rules. And I think he gave the example of Daniel Kaluuya, which is quite interesting. He was in the film Get Out. But he was explaining that Daniel Kaluuya actually had a very violent run in with the police. Already an actor, he was acting in skins, but he was just mistreated by the police for a crime that he just fit this description of, he didn't actually do anything. It does a good job of like doing, giving this really global perspective and then like zooming into his own personal um, stories and personal history. I think it's like very hard to do, it's hard to find that balance. If the idea of something with this much history in it intimidates you, I would really recommend listening to Yakala speak on YouTube about um, different things. I know he's appeared on a few talk shows. I really recommend listening to him speak because um, I think he tells um, stories really well. That's everything I read in January. Um, I hope I'm able to do this again in February but I'm still working with like a four gigabyte memory card to make these videos so it's like a really awkward process but it's really fun to do so let me know what you've been reading in January. I'm still looking for like inspiration for new things to read um, and I have a book order coming this week which is really exciting so yeah if you enjoyed this you can subscribe. Um, you can follow me on Instagram. Um, it's just books are brain food. There'll be a link in the description and also to my blog. Um, I'm trying to update my blog like really regularly. You can just scroll through and see if there's any books on there that interest you um, and you can read my reviews before you decide to buy it. Um, but hopefully you'll find something that you like and yeah, I hope you're doing well.